Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's PHO webinar presentation on the overview of the shared health equity dashboard for Southeastern Ontario. My name is Trevor Van Ingen. I'm an epidemiologist lead at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation, and please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. Following uh, a discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. It's now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Megan Carter. Megan Carter has an MSc in Epidemiology and PhD in Population Health, both from the University of Ottawa. She is a research associate at KFLNA Public Health and adjunct professor, adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Queen's University. She has over 15 years of experience working in public health and population health and has extensive skills and expertise in epidemiology, research, and program evaluation. Megan is passionate about measuring and improving public health. She strives to support evidence-based decision-making and efficient and effective public health practice that considers health equity, quality improvement, and complex systems. Over to you, Megan. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, it, I'm very excited today to provide an overview of the Shared Health Equity Dashboard. But before I begin, I would just like to recognize that KFNA comprises the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Mississauga, and Anishinaabek nations. I'm grateful for the care and attention that they've brought to these lands into all Indigenous communities that currently live in and call KFLNA home. I hope we can learn from your teachings and example to better live in harmony with nature and with others. I'll start with this disclaimer and then go on to today's presentation will outline the who, what, when, where, and why of uh, of SHED and how. The how will probably be the longest part. I'll also talk about a summary and next steps. And I'd also like to brave the technology risk and briefly demo SHED for you. Now SHED started pre-pandemic with the goal of collaboration, standardization and sharing data resources across local public health agencies in the Southeastern region. We that being a research, a working group of us at KFLNA Public Health including epidemiologists and research associates have been working with epidemiologists at Hastings Prince Edward Public Health and Leeds Grenville Lanark District Health on this project since the beginning. So kudos to this working group for getting uh, shed off the ground. Um, this has involved us working together, developing a shared understanding of what we wanted in the end, a terms of reference and uh, a data sharing agreement, then of course meeting regularly to decide on the methods, uh, implementing uh, the methods, and then reviewing the outputs together. So the end product here uh, is an interactive dashboard that allows users to identify health gaps using select health indicators that we have ready access to. Now, why do we need SHED? And forgive me, most people on the on the call here probably know this, but it is, is the basis for doing SHED, and I think it's really important to highlight. So some groups might be disadvantaged from being at their healthiest because of race, social class, gender, uh, disability, or some other socially determined circumstance or situation. Health inequities exist when certain social groups experience a lower level of health than more advantaged groups. Health inequities are systematic, meaning they happen over and over again in different situations. They are modifiable, which means they can be changed, uh, and they're considered unfair and unjust. Data can help identify gaps in health, which can represent inequities. Um, and these may be areas where public health, healthcare, and community partners can work together to reduce these gaps. To build on the quote, what gets, what gets measured gets done, which doesn't quite work for me. Instead, I prefer what gets measured can be more systematically actioned and progress monitored. What isn't measured may not get enough attention. SHED was built to be easy to follow, but it's not designed for the public writ large. It's for anyone who works with data and health indicators um, in the southeastern region of Ontario, but it can go beyond that. And you can find SHED at this URL. This goes to a landing page that links to 
dashboard pages for different types of indicators, and I'll get into that in a bit. The landing page also has a demonstration on how to use SHED, explanation of explanations of technical terms and interpretation of estimates, as well as a detailed downloadable um, methods, technical methods document that I'm sure you're all dying to read. And as I'll touch on throughout the presentation, this is an evolving project. It's evergreens. We're adding uh, indicators. We're seeking feedback. And on the landing page, there's a form for um, users to provide feedback. And there's a, a, a short reflective process that we hope people would go through um, when using SHED. And that's outlined on the landing page. Now, how is SHED developed? These next few slides collectively describe that. So as I said, we started pre-pandemic in 2018 thinking about this project. And it actually included the Southeast Lynn at the time, which is no longer. Uh, we wanted to work collaboratively across agencies to develop a version of the health inequalities data tool that was more simplified. It drilled down to our Southeastern populations and of course continued on like the health inequalities tool does with intersectional analysis by sex and gender if possible. And we also wanted to be able to monitor inequities over time. Um, originally the health inequalities uh, data tool was built to support Canada's pledge under the World Health Organization Rio Declaration to take action to promote health equity. It is seen and I see it as a critical tool for strengthening, strengthening the capacity to monitor and report on health inequalities. It's a collaboration between public Health Agency of Canada, the Pan-Canadian Public Health Network, uh, Statistics Canada, and the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And it builds on a set of indicators that was developed by the public, the Pan-Canadian Public Health Network in 2010. And we referred to any and all guidance documents, technical documentation from this to guide us in SHED. When choosing indicators, we wanted to cover some of those from the network, uh, but there, there are a lot of indicators in this tool. Uh, we considered the, these fra this framework, but we wanted to start small and then build. We also wanted to cover as many different data sources available to us in the first iteration, and of course build on that. And so this included things like the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, data that's only available to P HUs such as um, diseases of public health significance systems like IFIS or CCM, uh, administrative hospital data from the discharge abstract database and the national ambulatory reporting system. We tried to define our indica indicators using established definitions, but this wasn't always possible given that we wanted to provide crude and age standardized estimates. We also wanted to to disaggregate by sex, and then um, we were disaggregating to local public health units, so uh, cell sizes became quite small. We referred to the Association of Public Health Epidemiologists in Ontario core indicators, definitions, of course, in Public Health Ontario snapshots, um, and those in the Kai High Indicator Library. Initially, we soft launch shed internally across the three health units and included indicators on substance use, oral and mental health, um, emergency department visits, chronic disease hospitalizations, and premature mortality. Later, we added high incidence infectious diseases from IFAS and from CCM, and then self-reported and behavior indicators from the CCHS, including like overall health, mental health, um, life satisfaction, community belonging, substance use, access to healthcare provider, um, physical and sedentary activity levels, and uh, vegetable and fruit intake. And we're currently working on um, maternal and infant related indicators from BORN. So when choosing equity stratifiers, we knew that we wanted sex and gender if available to be a stratifier. And, and we also, also wanted to have it intersect with other stratifiers, allowing for intersectional analysis and then sex gender based analysis. Uh, and we made heavy use of Kai High's Measuring Health Inequalities Toolkit, which includes an equity uh, stratifier inventory and explains which equity stratifiers are available in specific data sources. We um, also use guidance documents on defining equity 
equity stratifiers and on using postal codes to define area-based measures. So this involves using the postal code conversion file or the plus version to assign individuals to census neighborhoods uh, and then to a measure, a social measure um, of the, at the neighborhood level. And as I said before, we also referred to any and all documentation from the health inequalities data tool. And so these are the equity stratifiers that we currently have in SHED for um, the hospital vital stats and data sources from public health units. We had to rely on linking postal codes to, to the Pampelon index. Um, so this is the deprivation index from the Institut National de Santé Publique du Québec and, and also linking them to statistical area classification codes to determine urban rural status. The CCHS has many equity related variables in its data sets. We focused initially on these ones here. So sex, education level, immigrant status, income level, language, sexual orientation and urban rural living. Um, but we uh, may be exploring others. There are no race-based variables available yet in health administrative and public health unit data sources, unfortunately. This is an active area of research and capacity building by public health units and um, other partners. So a previous locally driven collaborative project has done a wonderful job to understand the experiences of public health units and the barriers and facilitators to sociodemographic data collection during COVID-19. And this included race-based data. And then they've gone on to provide recommendations at the system level and then organizational organizational level, so the public health unit level moving forward. Now the CCHS includes a population group variable based on Statistics Canada's census and employment equity questions. But before using it, we would like to consult with fellow colleagues at a FIO uh, and local groups to determine how best to define and analyze this going forward. What presents a challenge for us specifically in the Southeastern region is that when we're calculating race-based metrics, our numbers, the cell sizes, the numerator, denominator will be small. Um, even when, like, when we're drilling down into each health unit itself, but even when we're aggregating up to the southeastern region. So metrics really become, um, they become unstable, unusable, and potentially identifiable. So we want to find a way that is acceptable um, to define this, this variable with our partners. In terms of the health gap measures, we focused on simplicity, usability, and ease of understanding. Um, so we've used just two measures, the rate ratio and the rate difference, but we also visually show incidence or prevalence of the indicator by the subgroup. Uh, the rate ratio is the relative measure of the health gap between two groups of people, the, an RR of greater than one. So I'll go into the graphs. So, uh, greater than one would be to the right of the graph, implies that the rate in the comparison group is higher than the rate in the reference group. And when we're talking about the comparison group, it's generally the group that is more disadvantaged compared to everyone else in our dashboard. And the rate difference is an absolute measure of the health gap between two, two groups of people. Uh, and an RD of greater than zero implies that there are more cases of the outcome in the comparison group compared to the reference group. And when we're looking at graphs, if for an estimate for the RR, um, if the confidence interval crosses one, uh, there's no difference between the two groups. And for the RD, if the confidence interval crosses zero, there's no difference. So the dashboard provides a very detailed explanation, I'm not doing it justice here, of the health gap measures and how to interpret them. And in terms of structure of SHED, and I'll highlight this hopefully in the live demo, on all pages you'll find at left, um, indicator and stratifier filters, selection buttons for regions, we have up to five. There's generally Ontario, uh, the Southeastern region, which, which is an aggregate of all three health units, and then the health units individually. We then have uh, the ability to age standardize or not. You can turn that on and off, uh, select pages, highlight statistical significance or not. Um, there's also graphs and the ability the ability to download them as images and tool tips for um, that's demonstrated here that actually give the characteristics of the estimate and a, um, a handy line for interpretation um, that helps in interpretation. Um, and then at the bottom of each page, there's data tables 
um, that have all the data for the graphs. Now, the first page is an introduction. It really goes, it's an overview. It provides the most recent data um, for the indicator selected. Um, you can uh, look to see in the middle here, there's a definition of the uh, stratifier, and then you can toggle to the indicator. Um, the incidence is shown in the middle here, and I'm looking at the wrong screen, and then the health gap. Uh, graphs are on the right there. Page two of the dashboard displays multiple regions for the most recent time period only, and the user has the ability to select and unselect regions. Uh, so so you, this is the point is here to compare across regions. Page three, um, multiple time points are displayed for one re region. Uh, the user has the ability to select and unselect time points. So you can compare across time points. Uh, and then for both pages, you can show the incidents like I have here, but then also the health gap measures. Now, the development of the tool has been an iterative process and the slide doesn't really give it justice. Uh, it's it involved developing a process pipeline, uh, calculating metrics in R, then storing them in SQL Server with upload to our retrieval by Power BI. So that's where the dashboard lives. Uh, visualization design involved lots of whiteboarding, then lots of PowerPoint mockups, and then lots of Power BI page drafts by data source. Um, then this would go through a round of review from our working group and tweaks would be added. Uh, then we conducted user testing uh, with pub our own public health staff. Uh, this was fully structured with tasks and then follow-up questions. And then feedback from users was incorporated in further PowerPoint, or sorry, not PowerPoint, Power BI page edits and refinements. So an example is uh, uh, where we got the idea to highlight statistical significance in, in those red boxes. And so once we were happy with, um, with the design, we concentrated on designing uh, the landing page uh, and then also the content, which actually took up a lot of time. Uh, this also went uh, through review in our working group. Uh, and then finally we launched, um, we connected the landing page uh, with the uh, Power BI. And we want to highlight again that this is evergreen where uh, we're going to be adding indicators and we're asking for feedback. Uh, so, just to wrap up, SHED is a dashboard to measure and monitor health and equities in southeastern Ontario. Uh, it's targeted to data analysts, people interested in health inequities, uh, health indicators, tech savvy staff, uh, local public health units and community organizations. There are several indicators available, um, but we will be adding new ones. So look for that in the coming months. Um, and we will also be consulting, and this is a big part of our work in the coming months with community partners and our own staff to get feedback on usability interpretation, like what, what do the results mean? How can we share results, um, indicators, stratifier priorities? Um, so if anyone uh, on the call here is interested in following along in our adventure um, and wants to stay in the loop, let me know and I'll, I'll connect. And now I will attempt to provide a live demonstration. So here is the share the, the landing page here. Um, we have all the background information, how to use the dashboard. They come down in accordions, um, reflective process. Uh, and then we have the links to our dashboards. And right now they're structured by uh, the different data source types. Um, so hospital usage and mortality, infectious diseases, and then self-reported measures. And this, this might change as we add uh, indicators and um, I will go and load up a dashboard. If it doesn't load, maybe the other page will. There we go. So here we have COPD hospitalization. This is the main page. 
uh, by material deprivation and it shows for one region only. It's um, the most up-to-date information. So this is where you can get a definition of the stratifier and then toggle to the indicator. Um, so this is just basically an overview and giving you more information. Um, so there's that. We can turn age standard standardization on if we want. And we can turn statistical significance off. So that's those red boxes here um, so that they will come on, off. Um, so we want to, we can either go to page two at the bottom or we can go to viewing multiple regions at once. So here we have the health gaps, but we also can look at incidence. And so there, here's the rate ratio and the rate difference. Um, but for me, I find I find it easiest to compare um, using the health gap, and we don't have um, the bot the red boxes for incidents. So for here across all regions, so we can unselect regions too if we want it to be clear. So if we wanted to take out the southeast region, just to have things a little bit clearer um, across the board here. It, uh, living in a more materially deprived area um, is associated with a higher rate of COPD hospitalizations. Um, so this is across regions. It's generally the same for males and females. Um, but if we were to go, say, to social deprivation, uh, it's, it's quite similar as well. So living in a more socially deprived area is associated with a higher uh, rate of COPD hospitalization. And then say if we were to go to urban rural. In Ontario, so the comparison is rural, living in a rural area is associated with a higher rate of COPD hospitalizations, but this isn't the case necessarily for public health units um, in the southeastern region. And if we were just to look at sex only, uh, interestingly, so the comparators, females compared to males, um, the rate for females is, is lower than that for males, but this is opposite in KFLNA. Now, let's say if we were to go to historical data, we want to look at, um, we want to look at data over time or the gaps over time specifically. Uh, and you can see here, well, this is for the Southeast region, but it's just primarily driven by KFLNA. So if we were to look at KFLNA, um, it, the association used to be like Ontario, but it slowly changed over time with females having a higher rate than males in 2019 to 2020. Um, say if we were to look at uh, material deprivation, in KFLNA, so we have males here, we have females here in total, and then we're looking over time. So it, it appears that the gaps net are pretty stable for KFLNA, but if we were to go to, I believe it's Hastings Prince Edward Public Health. For males, the gap has increased for both rate ratio and rate difference over time. And then if we were to look at urban rural, And then Ontario. So this, the gaps look fairly stable over time, but then we look at Leeds Grenville Lanark. Uh, for males, they've they've stayed pretty similar, haven't moved, but for females. The gap has changed from women having lower rates to having higher rates than males. Um, or sorry, the that 
among women living in rural areas, they have higher rates than women living in um, urban areas. So this has changed over time. Uh, and so this is just, it, it's a whirlwind demo of the different comparisons you can make. Um, and with this format, I think there's the ability to add more regions, probably not um, with the ability to display them all at the same time, but certainly to compare them. Uh, and Trevor, I will unmute and over to you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Megan. So we're now moving on to the Q&A segment of this event to address some of the questions from our audience. Uh, please continue to enter your questions into the Q&A pod if you have not had the opportunity to do so already. So we have uh, a couple of questions already. I, I think I'd like to start off with one of my own and just give an opportunity for, for more people to, to add some. So I noticed you use the, um, the INSBQ deprivation index. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that decision to use that particular deprivation index and not um, one of the alternatives. <clears throat> Um, so for this particular one, uh, it has a material and a social deprivation dimension, and we were looking for a social capital related measure and that uh, this particular tool has that ability. Um, we were investigating on March, so the Ontario Marginalization Index. Um, it does have a material deprivation uh, dimension, but it doesn't have uh, the social deprivation one. And what would be of interest to us would be the, I, I think, I believe it's called something different now, ethnicity and diversity dimension. That uh, would be of interest, but the Southeastern region, it, I don't, it wouldn't work very well. Sorry, Trevor. Oh, no, I was, I don't mean to step on your toes. Racialized and newcomer population. Okay, that's, yeah, that's why. And at uh, the INSPQ, they are planning to update that measure with 2021 data. So we'll see where that goes, but uh, and we're interested in exploring um, others as well, but we wanted to also keep it very, very simplified. All right, thanks. I'll move on to the chat pod now. So we have a question here. Is the download image file a native Power BI feature, or was this something that you designed with custom scripting? Uh, we designed that with custom scripting. And so that was, yeah, not something that was readily available at the time. Um, uh, so yeah, we could, I can connect further to the person who asked that to let them know how that could be done. The next question here is, would you consider providing interpretation, e.g. Uh, what you're doing here live? This is complex information and may be tricky for your audience to interpret as you'd like them to, even if they are health professionals from the various health regions. Uh, very good question. Um, so that is the consultation process. Um, we would like to know how people can use it, um, if we can make it more simple, um, and what sort of knowledge, knowledge exchange products would be of benefit to them. And if there's any sort of in-service that we can provide to different com community organizations and our staff. Um, but that's a really, really good question. I, I find, yeah, dashboards, uh, it's, you need to really target them to an audience, um, but their data and I, th I think it, yeah, it, they can be complex to interpret. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Did you explore the option to download data as a feature? Um, I, the, we did. And for some reason, so the data tables are there containing all the, the calculated information. Um, at one point, I believe we had that ability. Um, I would have to go back to my team to determine why that, the, why that's not with, um, available anymore. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, another question here, are there plans to include indigenous population data indices, even though data is often inaccurate or difficult to access because it is federally regulated? That's a very tricky question and um, we do want to do that. Um, we have to explore um, data sources that would be acceptable and uh, you know definitions of indicators and stratified, like it's, 
it's a process in, that we'd like to engage. And I know some other health units are a lot further along in this than we are, um, but that's definitely on our radar um, for sure. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here related to this. So given that geography is not a full representation of a person and their health data, uh, including over 900 reporting, how would you make consideration for the over 133 First Nations and Métis and Inuit population in Ontario's data sets? Consideration for more than half of Indigenous people living off reserve lands and census data not being collected in First Nations. So have you explored self-identification for nations to have true representation? No, we have not done all, all that yet. Um, and we need... Um, We've, we've started the exploration process, but no, we haven't taken the steps to do that. And that's a great point. Um, we do not have a reserve in our health unit, but our sister health units that are involved in this do, um, and they're a bit further along. So that engagement process has not 100% um, happened yet. Um, we're hoping like during COVID-19, um, partnering with different groups has, I think, open the door to this process. So that's something um, in the future that we'll be embarking on. So thanks. Uh, I'll just put another call out. We have uh, some time left here. So if anyone has any other questions to please enter them in the chat pod. Uh, I'll ask another or myself. So, um, <clears throat> so related to the interpretation piece, you know, uh, we've had to think a lot about the uh, risks of potentially producing some result or some some data that could uh, inadvertently lead to stigmatization, um, mm -hmm. especially if that result could maybe reinforce like an existing stigma. So do you have any thoughts or have you guys thought or discussed about um, how to address stigmatization in these uninterpreted dashboard products? What are your thoughts then? <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> that's a, no, that's a great question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have the interpretation in the, the tool tips, and obviously that doesn't go that extra level for people using the dashboard and interpreting them, them the, the results themselves. Um, this COVID put a wrench in all of this, so we haven't got as far along as we'd like to, but we initially had developed um, one pagers, um, and we want to engage with different partners, community organizations to produce uh, knowledge exchange products, whatever whatever's wanted um, and would be used by them. Um, so it's our hope that with community input that we can develop um, products that will avoid stigmatization, but having the dashboard publicly available, we can't we can't stop that, right? Like the people, however they interpret the data, they're going to interpret it. But I'd yeah. like to know your thoughts. Well, I asked the question because it's it's a genuine challenge, yeah. right? This is yeah. sort of, um, it, you're, you put out a lot of data, a lot of different results, and it's really very difficult to weed through it and determine you know, what people are gonna do. So uh, this is something that we're, we're working on as well and trying to come up with ways of, of, of you know, mitigating that risk without, uh, destroying all the benefit of providing data for people to access. Right. Um, and you're speaking for the equity, health equity snapshots in particular? Or uh, just in general in the work we do at Public Health. Mm -hmm. But um, specifically, I do work on the, those equity snapshots. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's two more questions in the chat pod, so I'll go back to them for a second. Uh, so uh, this is really awesome. I'd be interested to hear more about how your audience received this tool and any feedback you've received about how they're using the data. Yeah. And in that process, we want to, as I said, engage them in developing knowledge exchange products too. Um, so yeah, I can definitely connect if you're interested in um, how this unfolds um, because that's definitely part of this project. Uh, great. And then another question here, to what extent has equity seeking communities been involved to date? Uh, in terms of the developing the day, the, the dashboard, um, we have developed this and we're going, we will be going out to get um, their, 
their feedback and engagement in terms of um, knowledge exchange products. Um, and then in terms of what they see as uh, priorities for stratifiers, indicators, or even other types of projects that we could do um, and add to the landing page, that's the next step in this. Um, so really in terms of our organizations, this, is, uh, this will be uh, shared with them and together their feedback. That's great. I'll just add a follow-up to these uh, equity seeking communities. Do you have existing relationships with them already, or is this something uh, we do, you know, and we do. And, Go on. Sorry, Trevor. Um, we do in different um, partnerships and collaborations that our different teams are a part of. It's complex because um, there's many different people in our health organization working on different things and building these partnerships. Um, so we have the expertise in um, um, data, and we need to make these relationships with even with our own staff, and um, and then into our community organizations. Uh, that are involved in different uh, different services, different different services, different um, advocacy initiatives in the community, um, and they have their ear to the ground. So we do have well developed partnerships, I would say, um, and especially so after COVID nineteen, because that really strengthened it. Um, so that's part of the process is involving our different teams that work with these organizations and community members. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just going to put out a final call for, for some more questions. Um, I think we might be able to wrap early today, but uh, please, if you have any more questions, uh, enter them in the chat pod. Uh, we have one more here. Uh, how can we access the dashboard? This is a great tool. Are there any restrictions to access? Nope. nope. Um, from the URL in the, uh, the slideshow. Or you can Google shared health equity dashboard KFLA. Oh, great. So it doesn't look like there are any more questions. Um, I guess we're going to start the wrap up. So uh, as, as we do today's wrap up for the PHO webinar, I would like to really thank Megan for presenting. And I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO webinar survey for today's session. Please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. Uh, and also a reminder to everyone that TOPIC, the Ontario Public Health Convention, will be held on March 26th and April 3rd in 2024. Check out topic.ca for details. And lastly, to access past PHO presentations and to view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events, and click on presentations. Thank you and have a wonderful day.